Hi there, this is Leah Cardos, and this is an analysis of David Bowie's song If You Can See Me from his 2013 album The Next Day. This analysis has been taken from my book, Black Star Theory, The Last Works of David Bowie. Let's go. The tempo of this song is 142 beats per minute. The tonalities are F minor in the verses and C sharp major in the choruses, which is a little bit unusual. These keys don't really go together. The song form is quite simple, A, B, A, B, A, alternating verses and choruses. The song structure has two opposing ideas taking turns, each of these ideas with its own unique metric device that dominates and cheats time. The A section, the opening vocalese and the chorus sections thereafter, is a polymetric ascending theme. And just to explain, polymeter is when two or more time signatures that share a common subdivision can be detected within a musical texture occurring at the same time. A good example of this might be Kashmir by Led Zeppelin, where you can hear that it is in 4-4 but also in 3-4. And in this case, the drum beat, guitar and percussion rhythms together are playing in a 4-4 meter, but the bass and the changing harmony is in 5-4. This creates a phase relationship between the two elements, where the down beats only come into alignment after 5 bars if you're counting in 4-4, or 4 bars if you're counting in 5-4. I made this figure to try and explain it, but hopefully you can hear it too. The ascending A section theme starts from F sharp, and for the first four bars, the music suggests Lydian mode, but it eventually arrives to establish a C sharp major tonality once it reaches the top of the phrase. Lydian mode is like a standard major scale, only with a sharpened fourth degree. The characteristic Lydian modal effect is famously heard in the opening notes of the themes to The Simpsons and The Jetsons. Bowie uses it surprisingly often, and I talk about this more in the book. It doesn't really apply here except for the fact that this song does play with the sharpened fourth, the tritone, quite often. The polymetric interplay between these two elements for the listener is disorienting and cumbersome. It's like cogs of uneven size turning at different speeds. This effect, when combined with the resolute ascension up the scale, moves with a grim, lumbering inevitability. The 5-4 bass line and chord progression conquers the frenetic 4-4 drum and percussion loop with easy strides to the top. The opposing B section is a tonally ambiguous riff starting on E, and the contour of this riff plays on the augmented fourth once again. And this riff is like a goading musical question. It is answered at the end of the phrase with an abrupt resolution to F minor, a quick, dark riposte. The B section motif also cheats time in a way. After six measures of 4-4, it resolves with two clipped measures of 3-4. This is a musical surprise. It creates a sneak effect inside the music, stealing pulses, cutting the natural rhythm of the phrase short. The themes of sections A and B are connected chromatically. The verse's ambiguous chord leading from E, which again for the music theory heads, could be an E suspended 2 or a C7 with a flattened fifth over E. And that depends on whether your analysis favours the underpinning chord resolution to F minor or the melody in what it's doing. But the chord leading from E, that mysterious chord, to F minor, after that, in the next section, it steps up 
the ascending scale from F sharp to that triumphant C sharp resolution, as though it has just climbed a summit and planted a flag. The bass is a central character in this composition. The lyrical shoots and ladders are illustrated in the bass's straight lines and trailing movements, either striding towards the ascent in the A sections, or sliding off its perch in the opposing B sections. The bassist here is Tony Levin, shadowed by the conspicuous presence of another well-known Bowie bassist. Gaylan Dorsey's wordless singing across the introduction summons memories from the live shows she appeared in, particularly the outside and earthling tours in the mid-1990s. A faint essence of the live duet version of Under Pressure and her singing over the interludes of Dead Man Walking. Dead Man Walking also features Zachary Alford on drums, who is heard here reprising similarly feverish breakbeat rhythms at the same hectic tempo. Bowie's layered vocal performance in the B sections is covered in effects and formant processing, digitally heightened in pitch to make the voice sound smaller. In the past, this trick was achieved with the very speed functions on a tape machine. It was how the high parts in the Laughing Gnome were made. Throughout the catalogue, Bowie uses this effect often to suggest mental illness, unnatural voices, or dark forces compelling destructive action. For example, in the final act of the Bulay Brothers from 1971, similar small voices are used to evoke something child demonic and sinister. An effect that was reprised on one outside a small plot of land. For Scream Like a Baby from 1980, Tony Visconti manually sped up and slowed down the tape while Bowie recorded his vocal, creating the sensation of the unnatural twisting of reality during the bridge when the troubled character of the song throws himself into a furnace. That could do what I did on a Bowie track called Scream Like a Baby. David was always into experimentation. He would, if I said, I've got an idea, he would light up and say, what is it? And I said, let's do this. And um, so and my bright idea was that he would do the monologue on one track as I was speeding the tape up. So the result would be that when I played it back at normal speed, his voice would go down in pitch very smoothly. Because if you're speeding the tape up, his voice on playback will get lower and lower and lower, and lower like that. And it was smooth. And then I said, now double track it on the other track, and now I'm going to slow the tape down while you're speaking. And I said, well, all you have to do is lock in on the drummer. Just listen to the drums and try to stay in tempo. You'll, you'll hear David's voice going like higher in pitch on one side and lower in pitch on the other side. No, 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 no. The use of the production signature here suggests a nightmarish aura around the narrator's voice. The final chorus, which is the concluding A section, also applies a backwards reverb effect that imparts a darker demonic edge. This effect leads with the reflection, as if the sound is being drawn in from the ether before it is uttered. It's like a premonition. Unstoppable. It's already happening before it's even happened. Bright keyboard tones from Bowie's Korg Trinity dominate the texture with an icy, lurid, fairground quality. The sound lures more spectres from scary monsters. The brittle, startled keyboard sounds from Scream Like a Baby. 
And because you're young. The three words from Bowie's list of 42 are crusade, tyrant and domination. The lyric opens with an image of somebody scheming a stealth attack, a plan to disguise in women's clothing, then meet somewhere specific with a knife at the ready. Perhaps the widely publicised story involving Taliban soldiers who had been caught wearing burqas in order to disguise themselves was an inspiration here. Aside from the faint echo of the red shoes from Let's Dance, the song sets up the scene for something nasty. The knife reveal in the lyric occurs just as the meter hastens from 4-4 to 3-4, as if the phrase itself is becoming eager and impatient at the mention of the world. As the song progresses, the threatening language gets stronger, more monstrous and violent, escalating from the excited knife plot to near ecstatic promises of genocidal annihilation. The vocal concludes triumphantly, slowing down just before the finish line because it can, it has already won the race. But the song doesn't end there. The victorious final chord crossfades briefly into something strange and oceanic. A lurching, groaning, sunken mass. In the album sequence, this track sits between men with guns. Following on from the massacre of Valentine's Day, this track's allusions to American fantasticalization summon imagery of wars in the Middle East which sowed the seeds for the emergence of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, the dumb and unstoppable American war machine that introduced the covert tactics of terrorism to our modern world. Just as an aside, when you look online for the lyrics to this song, somebody's put this down as Fantastic Alsatian, which I think is so funny. If you can see me, I can see you, is a sniper's promise. To take your shot in a gunfight, you have to break cover. The following track, I'd Rather Be High, continues with similar imagery of guns being trained on men in the sand. The narrator of the piece is the archetypal tyrant. Convinced of their centrality to the universe, taking pleasure in the violent domination of everything they see before them, becoming increasingly intoxicated with the notion of their own power. The only thing they fear is the idea of karma, the fear of rear windows and swinging doors. However, the musical composition denies the existence of even-handedness and equality, instead establishing unfair advantages and allowing the breaking of rules without consequence. The larger footprint strides easily while the smaller one is forced to run. The musical theme steals time and removes pulses to achieve its ends, destabilizing symmetry and equilibrium. The production evokes the daunting density and tumult of Bowie's mid-90s era outputs, one outside and earthling. Its clever interlocking design, lending the chaotic, uneven atmosphere a twisted sense of logic. Like one outside, the construction is a dark mirror reflecting back at us our most monstrous nature. If offered the chance to dominate and persecute without consequence, would we take it? The archetypal tyrant is selfish and empowered in the pursuit of their own agenda, no matter the cost. If you can see me, I can see you, is Bowie's call to enhanced self-perception. Its final moments contemplating the murkiest depths of a sombre reflection. In confrontation with the darkest of shadows, will we be able to recognise ourselves?